Thank you, Ilkka. Uh, just a quick show of hands to begin with. Uh, uh, how many of you play free-to-play games? Shame on those who don't. <laughs> and how many of you actually pay for free-to-play games? At least occasionally. And uh, finally, how many of you are already like working with games or... or and, and the rest of you, I, be, I understand, are, are going to. Um, so my name is Ville Heijari. Uh, I've been working for a year now with a company called Playhaven. And in December uh, 2013, Playhaven merged with Contagent. So Playhaven makes marketing tools for mobile games and applications. Uh, Contagent makes analytics. And uh, now our plan is to build, merge these two products so we have like an analytics platform that then, then allows you to also, also combine auto marketing automation uh, based, based on the user data. Uh, but um, I'm not going to talk about our product, but today I'm going to talk about the trends when it comes to analytics, uh, marketing, monetization within applications. A bit about the history as well, a bit about like, uh, like overall, the overall landscape. Um, and I know that you've already had a number of lectures uh, and probably a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been touched uh, already. Uh, I hope that I can bring, bring like new angles and, and some, some new ideas here as well. At any point, feel free to, to interrupt me, ask questions, voice your opinions, uh, call bullshit, anything, anything that, uh, that uh, you may wish, yeah, feel free to do so. So uh, just a couple of, couple of words, what I used to do before. So before I joined Playhaven, I was working for Rovio, uh, leading the marketing team for Angry Birds. Uh, and I joined Rovio in uh, 2010, when Angry Birds has already had like 6.5 6 million downloads. And it was, it was like starting to take off uh, in the summer of 2010. And back then, the world, world was uh, very different. So, um, GDC, Game Developers Conference 2010, uh, 2010, in March 2010, that was like the sort of pivotal moment of clarity for the industry when, when uh, Neil Young, the CEO of uh, a company called NG Moco, he, he held a big lecture uh, talking about free to play. And basically, like he, he sort of tore open like all of their games and how free to play monetization changed their life and, and changed their uh, uh, company entirely. And uh, he went on uh, to sell NG Moco uh, for a Japanese um, a company called Dina for hundreds of millions of dollars. So obviously, like, there was a lot of, lot of worth and value to be explored in free-to-play. Uh, but still, uh, the overall landscape was very different. So for example, you had, uh, with Rovio, you had a couple of games out there on the market. And the business was built largely then on creating more games around that brand and cross-promoting those games and selling all these games for 99 cents. And of course, if you sell hundreds of millions of downloads, hundreds of millions of applications for 99 cents each, uh, you're going to make add up uh, a lot of value. But then, of course, like there's, there's also like a sort of limit of how many, how many applications you can cross-sell and how much are you then like, like extending and building the brand. Uh, through meaningful collaborations, uh, then how do you innovate? How do you go beyond? And for example, in case of Rovio, uh, Rovio is now trying to break out of the mold of that 99 cent business and go into free to play. And uh, if you've been following uh, that particular company and for example, Angry Birds Go, the real first like proper free to play racing title, it launched in December and it, it pretty much peaked in top 20 but never really broke, uh, top grossing, never really broke into like the really top, top grossing elite of the games. And uh, as, as probably just as, um, as um, repetition, why is free to play, why is it lucrative? Why does a company like Rovio go from, from the paid application to free to play? Is that in free to play, you used to have like your, the amount of money, the price point and the audience, the maximum audience you can reach. And, and in the app case of app stores and application marketplaces, the price went down to the lowest bracket to be able to reach an audience as wide as possible. But then when we're thinking about free to play, we're sort of eliminating that box. So anybody, theoretically anybody who is in the audience, in the target audience of that game could be spending any amount of money, money on that game, theoretically. And uh, of course, like as of today, when we look at like the top 10 most uh, top grossing applications, um, applications on, on iOS today, 
Uh, this, this list uh, is mostly like, has mostly been stagnant for the past six months at least. So you see like the same big publishers uh, stick in the top grossing lists uh, because they are the ones who are also putting more emphasis on user acquisition and retention uh, so, that, so that they will stick there and generate more revenue. And uh, these are the companies who are, who are making like up to millions of dollars a day in revenue all, and that's on Apple alone. And of course like uh, this, is a, this is a very, again like a very fickle market because um, for example King has had like for long has had like a sort of unstated ambition of, of aiming for an IPO and, and getting listed, uh, listed on the stock market. And um, uh, for example, as of the day before yesterday, the Telegraph was already writing that, that King has put IPO on hold because uh, there was no news on their IPO in this uh, time frame, um, contrary to the analysts' expectations. And then of this afternoon, uh, King has filed for US IPO. So basically, uh, there's a lot of rumors, a lot of speculations of whether any single company can sustain their business and profitability on like, for example, an insane success like, uh, like Candy Crush Saga. Uh, and of course, King has introduced more games, is marketing them really aggressively. If you look at that top 10 grossing today, they have three games in the US uh, top grossing chart, uh, top 10 um, uh, on iOS. And um, obviously like these, when, when any of these companies files for an IPO, you should definitely go and dig out, dig out their, their filings with the, with the US uh, Securi Securities and Exchange Commission because these filings contain pretty much like all the, all the data points for the first time in public, uh, how their business is faring, how, how their business has been doing in, in the recent history and how they expect it to do in the future. And, and these are really good, good, good sort of benchmarks and guidelines on what to look for and what to expect. For example, this is, I'm sorry, this is a bit, bit small print. I just did a quick screen grab like two hours ago, but like King's um, uh, year uh, 2011, um, the total revenue was 63 million, 2012, 164 million dollars, and uh, 2013, 1 billion, 884 million uh, dollars and, and some, some spare. So obviously like this, this gives us like a pretty good impression of uh, Yes. Yeah, do you think Rovio is going to follow that same? Well, Rovio doesn't have like a, like a super successful free to play game out on the market. Like like uh, Angry Birds Go is really like their first proper free to play title and they uh, they pretty much launched that in December. So, this is King uh, racking up revenue for the entire duration uh, of 2012 uh, in basically like top 1 to top 3 ranking in the top grossing chart. And uh, you, you, you really can't catch up with that in uh, three weeks. Just one question about that, so if, if you examine it a little bit more. Yeah. So do you have any guess how it's possible that even though they had like 1.8 billion yes. revenue, they had only, only less than 700 uh, million? Yeah, so yeah. Ac actually, Actually, I'm not sure about the like the cost of revenue, like, like whether that includes like the, the Apple share and so on. It includes Apple shares and it's about 30% of, of, the, of the revenue. Yes. The cash flow was only one third of the revenue. So then you go to sales and marketing. Yeah. And sales and marketing in King's case is $376 million. Yeah. So, so that's if you take Apple share away, you get to 1.3 billion. You take everything else, that's a couple of hor hor more um, uh, uh, hundreds of million away, and uh, we get like close to one billion dollars, and then we have uh, 300 and, uh, 376 million dollars in sales and marketing. So basically, like uh, like the sort of general wisdom on the market has been that anyone with a successful top uh, top ten grossing free to play game is spending approximately 15 to 35 percent of their revenue on back into user acquisition to sort of keep keep feeding that beast and, and finding like more paying customers. And here it's it's like very literal, like that 376 million that comes close to that like upper bracket of uh, of 35 uh, percent. Uh, of course, that's just, a, that's just a sort of rule of thumb in the industry. You could be spending anything. Like if, if, you're, if your average paying customer, average, average revenue per customer is, is $10, 
why not spend like like nine dollars and ninety cents acquiring those customers if you can make sure that you can get that ten cents uh, of profit out of out of every customer? Of course, like then you can start thinking that is this very sustainable that you're paying like super premium per per customer? But then that's that's another discussion. Okay, but yeah. Uh, let's go into some, some 2014 trends and best practices. So I'm going to start about uh, discussing um, data and, and big data and analytics in particular. Uh, how they, how they like affect, affect our, our ecosystem, what we can do about like getting more data, more valuable data and, and using it on, on marketing actions. And then go into, go into some case studies of, uh, of actual uh, marketing actions and, and um, and what their what the results have been in uh, in different mobile games. So, 2014, we we've sort of as a company we've labeled it as the year that uh, big data becomes actionable. So uh, basically, data analysis is is a main driver for for every like online and digital service. How do people use use the services? What what actual like parts they they do? What actions they take? And and this is like a sort of um, in this industry, we sort of have the luxury and privilege of, of really seeing like almost real time of what do the users do? How do they consume the product? And um, so why is this a trend? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's basically like also comes from like the, like the biggest sort of influencers in the industry. For example, Eric Schmidt from Google, he said in his year-end predictions, uh, the biggest disruptor that we're sure about is the arrival of big data and machine intelligence everywhere. So the ability for businesses to find people, to talk specifically to them, to judge them, to rank what they're doing, to decide what to do with your products changes every business globally. So pretty much like games, mobile applications, services, anybody who has like some kind of digital interface and feedback channel to their customer uh, can utilize that data, uh, that usage data and change and optimize their products and provide more personal, personal experiences. And so, so what is big data? Well, this goes, this goes to the simplest definition of, of Wikipedia that big data is the term for a collection of data sets so large and complex that it becomes difficult to process using on-hand database management tools or traditional data processing applications. And the challenges with big data we're talking about so much information that the challenges include capture, curation, storage, search, sharing, transfer, analysis, and visualization. And of course, like um, these are these are all we can resolve. So basically, uh, if we think about capture, when we're just sort of critical enough what to capture, we're not capturing like uh, sort of unnecessary junk. Um, we just get like our essential business data. Uh, and if we're thinking about like cloud solutions, a, any kind of modern modern like service infrastructure, storage shouldn't be an issue. You just add like sort of more Amazon nodes or whatever. You can always store more data. Uh, it's only like when it becomes super massive that it, it starts to starts to become uh, less economical. And um, then the bigger bigger these data sets become, you it becomes like harder to just mine them. So you need specialist tools to really make queries to find specific information information in these data sets. And then uh, if we think about sharing and transferring, sharing and transferring the data itself, uh, that's not so much a challenge. But then like when you derive information from that, how do you really like share what this data is saying about your business? which sort of then connects to analysis and visualization. Like, okay, I get this bulk data about my game sessions, my players completing goals, uh, using items, so on, whatever. Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean in conjunction to monetization, to time spent in game, and so forth? Uh, so more often, uh, when, when we really like it, when, when people still, when they talk about analytics, they often just come back to like daily active users, average revenue per user, and, and so on. And, and these numbers by themselves, they're sort of vanity metrics. So they tell you really nothing about what's happening. They tell you about the scale, they tell you about the reach, but it's, they really don't tell you anything about the, like the real actual health of what's happening in the business today. So uh, basically, uh, and, and they don't help you, like, like having an X amount of of users today and this much more the next day, how much of them are going to, how much are going to retain 
and, and how is your business going to grow. So, so the sort of individual metrics don't help you uh, estimate and predict uh, the health of your business uh, a month from now, two months from now. So that's when you then need, need really like the data analysis. And data analysis is not individual numbers, but it's exploratory and it's, it's visual and it's how you present like where, where your business is going to be. Uh, just like uh, as a quick visualization, uh, if I have an X amount of LinkedIn contacts and you come to me and say that I need to hire a marketing guy, I can, I can just go and like, you know, uh, like if I remember someone's name, I'll, I'll find them from my contacts. But then there's like also means to like map, like who is doing what, who is in which industry and sort of start, start exploring uh, like the, uh, that, uh, that where are, where, what are these people actually doing. And this is like a LinkedIn visualization of data sets based on just like connections, industry, how are different people connected. So it's fairly simple data. Uh, but when we're talking about games and big data, so games are simple, right? So why, why, why would games like, why do they necessitate uh, big data tools and management, like how can games generate big data? Well, uh, first of all, if we think about where the data is coming, here's like really basic uh, product, product telemetry from a game. Uh, a final analysis of level completion. This would be something that you, you especially do in product development, uh, soft launching a game. Soft launch an arcade game with 30 levels and see how many people complete how many of those. 100% uh, uh, of, uh, of your users complete 100% of the levels, you have either an amazing game or it's like far too easy and simple and, and so forth. Uh, and of course, if you have like a significant drop off somewhere, there must be like some kind of hang up. Again, maybe it's not interesting, uh, maybe it's too difficult, maybe there's a bug, maybe it's wrong, maybe you can't proceed to the next level, uh, at least on like certain device, devices or so on. But if you think about that, you're getting like this kind of data points per level. And if you're measuring then like individual goals within a level, uh, individual interactions, objects, so on, you might have like already like, uh, like a couple of dozen data points uh, for, uh, for, for sort of a simple gameplay analysis. And then if you, if you think about doing this analysis while running a live game for millions and millions of users, you're capturing, capturing an insane amount of data from, from every gaming session. And, and this is then just the gameplay. This is just how your game functions. But then you get to the player behavior. How much money are the, these players spending? What's the location, device language, uh, first session, last session date, total sessions, time spent in game, which OS version, game version, hardware, are they on Wi-Fi, 3G, and so forth. So uh, why is then this data necessary is that this is how you analyze your user cohorts, your user segments. Uh, for example, how many users do you have from China? Does it make sense to localize your game in Chinese? Uh, are they spending on any money? Should you show advertising to the Chinese audience and maybe like uh, promote in-app purchases to, to the US audience if they're spending more money and so on. So to, to have like a like more educated idea and assessment of your users and, and build segments, segments out of them. Again, like, like this is an order of magnitude more data uh, compared to, the, compared to the, uh, the product telemetry. And then uh, when you think about, okay, monetizing your game, you start thinking about ad networks, uh, sort of CRM on how you manage your, how do you manage your customers, uh, any, any other like sort of communications, marketing tools, email marketing and so forth. There's, today there's more than a thousand digital marketing technology products out there. And of course, a fragment of this only app, like applies to gaming specifically. But you could be used like a number of analytics tools for different purposes. Uh, you could integrate number of advertising products uh, some kind of customer service interface, different APIs, again, uh, like generating more data. And uh, when, we, when I, you know, I'm a simple guy, I like simple analogies. So in, in this data, why do you want to make sense of this? I, I think about something like this. So it's, it's cartography of what your game is, who's playing it, who's the competition, where it is like on this map. Like in medieval times, uh, these cartographers, when there was like unknown waters and treacherous places, they used to used to like take some artistic liberty and 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 uh, paint some beasts there because 
it was dangerous to go there. And it's the same in product development. What you don't know will kill you. So you make assumptions that I'm going to make this game for audience X. They'll probably like it because I played it with my friends and they said it's amazing. So let's invest hundreds of hours into developing something. So do you want to test it and do you want to verify it with data or do you just want to base it on assumptions? And uh, uh, like today, it's relatively easy to, to put together a quick production cycle and to put things out in limited markets, be it Finland or New Zealand or Indonesia or wherever, and, and test them. Verify, verify your hypothesis of is this game fun to play? Does anybody want to play this more than, more than twice? So with all this data, uh, the challenges uh, of big data are capture, storage, sharing and so on. But, but if, if we think about it, uh, it's, it's not really like the curation and transfer and sharing. If those, those we can all solve with technology. But how do we take it into action? So when you have your analysis, when you have your, uh, you have, whether you are the business intelligence guy or you have another business intelligence guy, uh, you have some kind of data analysis, you have somebody looking after monetization, uh, these are all becoming like increasingly more merged. So it's, it's not that like, you know, somebody, some other guy from the next, next floor or, or the next room brings you an Excel sheet and, and tells you to somehow interpret it and, uh, and make changes to the game. But how do, you, how do you enable this kind of environment where you can dynamically do stuff? Like if, if something doesn't work in the game, you, you can dynamically A, B test it. Uh, you can test different variations. Uh, you can drive different content, or, or uh, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if it's something that you then actually need to make, make proper changes into the product itself, at least you have, you have you know, like your product information, your product intelligence, you have your business intelligence sort of side by side. So you don't have to like go between different products, different dashboards, different reports, and sort of try to piece together like what should be the next step. So, uh, so the concept of actionable data is, is, has been like in, in uh, sort of buzzword uh, map uh, last year and this year. And what it really means is that uh, how do you bridge that gap from having all those numbers, having all those reports, uh, and having them like as easily accessible as possible to, to relevant, people, uh, relevant people in the team, in the organization, uh, to really like uh, take action immediately and not sort of get l get lost in in just reporting and interpretation, and of course like uh, you could say that this this affects like bigger organizations the most. Obviously, like if there's more and more data, more and more people trying to make sense of it, it gets more complicated. But the same is true for for smaller teams. If you're an agile small team and you still want to make intelligent, educated decisions. Uh, based on based on data, actual actual relevant data, uh, you don't want to spend all your time. Actually, you probably the smaller the team, the less you will have time to to go and, and look for at different different sort of um, data points and cross referencing them. So how how can you enable something like this? You need clearly defined strategic KPIs. So what are the main <laughs> key performance indicators in your game that really really drive your business? Like for example, like when you're, when you're just developing the product, uh, if you have a problem with users not understanding how to play the game, how to use the product, uh, you will have some kind of huge drop off in your level completion, in your gameplay analytics. And then probably like you could, as a, as a solution, you could introduce, for example, a tutorial. Here's how you play the game. Go here to build this building, click here to, to speed it up, click here to finish it. We've all played some of those. So then one of your metrics becomes like how many people, when they downloaded the game, how many people completed the tutorial, how many people then finished level one, finished level two, leveled up, and so forth. If, if these are like your, your strategic KPIs, it's on your responsibility to really, really define like which of these are the crucial ones that you need to measure. Uh, and then when you're doing analytics, you need to instrument them equally carefully so that the data you get is, it's, is not corrupt. Again, you, you're not measuring like, a, like technically the wrong things uh, and you get it as, as real time as possible. Uh, then sampling versus complete data. 
Uh, a lot of analytics uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, sort of uh, services and platforms, they offer you like the option to either capture everything and then, then look at it. And of course, there's, that's a shit ton of more data. Or then maybe you can sample it at like relevant times at peak hours and so forth. So you only sort of take a, take a slice of the data. Uh, a problem with sampling, sampling of obviously like it saves a lot of cost, uh, it saves a lot of, uh, there's less data to manage and, and analyze, you, your analysis process might become faster. The problem there is uh, it gives you like this sort of broadcast overview. Uh, if we're thinking about our, our business, the business we're in, if we make free to play games, first of all we have a limited number of users. Uh, we have a tiny percentage of that, that user base actually spending money, actually being like the super engaged players. And then we have a tiny, tiny percentage of those people actually spending a lot of money and, and being like the, like the biggest, biggest customers and so on. So it might be that you might lose out on some of the most valuable data of, of, of usage of your product. So this, that's a consideration like whether whether to capture everything or whether to just sample, uh, sort of taking like a snapshot of the data and, and seeing uh, what's the usage like. Um, and then of course like data has to be available and transparent. So when, if you're building a team, your organization grows, uh, you have like separate functions for, you have a game development team who then liaises with the analytics team and maybe you have like a, some kind of monetization guru who, who sits uh, completely separately from everybody else. Don't build silos, like break down every possible barrier for, for sort of data exchange. So everybody who is critical uh, to making this kind of product decisions where they increase value for your business should have like a ready access to the data so that you don't need to like uh, go and apply for, for something to get access to somewhere. Of course, this can be, this can be a risk point as we saw with uh, Supercell a few weeks ago. Uh, if you make everything really transparent in your organization, uh, somebody decides to hack your organization, they, they also have access, probably, probably pretty easily. But I would still argue that it's, it's much more valuable for your business to have basically allow everybody access to all the, all the data possible. Uh, and of course, it needs to be connected. The data needs to be connected to the necessary processes and tools to accomplish the finding people, talk specifically to them, judge them, rank what they're doing, decide what to do with your products. So uh, when, when you have like everything to interpret the data to get the results, how do you turn them to action? What, are, what is like the actual, if you need to send, a, let's say you need to send a push notification, at, hey, like, uh, like to your, your lapsed players, uh, you need to send like, um, you need to enable some kind of uh, guidance or, or tutorial or something in the game. Where does it happen? Like, do you again, like, do you interpret the data and then go and change your product or can you enable it online? And there's several different uh, customer relationship management tools, uh, different communications tools that allow in-game messaging notifications and so forth, for example. Uh, so uh, sort of established like where the data is coming from and, uh, and uh, how, how do you, like in principle, what do you need to do uh, to make it actionable? So what's in the essential like toolkit? Uh, what, do you, what do you need to, what do you need? What kind of tools, what kind of interfaces do you need uh, to, to get all this data? Uh, so the first of all, I've sort of identified six here and I will just go, go through them uh, quite briefly. Uh, so product te telemetry, again, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's Flurry, whether it's Contagion, whether it's an an another uh, analytics pr uh, product, localytics, mixed panel, so forth. Uh, this is like the, what's, what's, what's like, uh, what goes on like, like in the sort of cockwork of your machinery of your game. Uh, when you're developing your game, uh, what are the drop-off points? What are the hang-ups? Uh, where are the technical problems? Where can, you, where can you help the players? Where can you make the experience more, more gripping and more fun? Uh, and this is mostly like, um, uh, this is the most useful when you're actually shipping product. So when you're publishing, launching a game, uh, when you measure it, that is it, is it working? Like, what do I need to do? Do we need an update? And, and so on. Uh, Actually, this is something that you don't want to run all the time. 
you don't want to go and revisit. Uh, this is something that you should be then like sort of verify that my game is running beautifully. There's no obstacles for new players. Um, so, so you you shouldn't be like shipping product every week. But you should use the soft launch period. You should use like some kind of like limited testing phase, where you make the product sort of as as finished as possible. Uh, because then when you get to get like more and more users into the game, what you then want to do is start analyzing the behavior, analyzing their value, and looking at okay, how do we how do we optimize uh, how do we optimize the monetization? How do we optimize the value in the long term? How do we enhance like the long-term lifetime value of those players? Uh, so uh, then next from uh, pro product telemetry, acquisition. And uh, acquisition, it's all about user growth. So basically you have your paid acquisition sources, you have social media sources, Facebook, Twitter, so forth. You have ad network. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the app stores, you have different, different cross-promotion tools. Uh, and where's the traffic coming from? Uh, here, the big channel challenge is like, how do you sol solve this sort of mess of what are the valuable traffic sources? Now, advertising net network uh, fragmentation, it's quite the pain point. Uh, for example, at, uh, at when I was working at Rovio, uh, we were planning to launch uh, Angry Birds on Android. And at that point, the Android market itself, like the device fragmentation was insane. Uh, there was like cheap devices that wouldn't even run the game. Uh, then there were like high-end devices where you could have provided like even a much more richer experience and everything from between. So uh, to add to this, uh, back in 2010, uh, Google Play didn't exist. It was like the predecessor under Android Marketplace. Uh, Google Wallet as a payment method wasn't there. It was a Google Checkout, which was much more clunkier uh, experience. So uh, you couldn't really like target the game to the devices. And to t on top of that, nobody was really spending any money. So then the re solution there was to, let's just put it out. It's free. It, run it has advertising as monetization. If it runs on your device, you know, it's free. You get your money back if it doesn't. <laughs> so basically, basically, like trying to provide as, as good a service as many a device as possible at, at the uh, sort of um, uh, price point where you can't really like like contest the value because it was free and back then it was as easy as uh, looking at which are the ad networks really generating like uh, enough enough fill have enough inventory to really run advertising to monetize this on a large scale and there was really like only one one answer it was AdMob. AdMob uh, back in uh, back in 2010 was running like sort of enough volume uh, to integrate a single ad network to be able to generate a lot of revenue over, over a large, large uh, uh, audience. Uh, nowadays, it's a, it's a bit more complicated, and especially on the acquisition side. How do you define, how do you verify, like, where is your game exactly getting the audience it deserves from? So basically, uh, how do you know that, you know, running video ads on, uh, on um, Ad colony or Vangle isn't more valuable to you, but if it's even if it's more expensive, than uh, running like some kind of acquisition campaign, uh, running running uh, uh, just advertising on Facebook or an acquisition campaign with Fixu or so on. Um, that that sort of takes us to the next pain point, which is attribution. Uh, so, no matter where you acquire users from, you can have tools. Uh, to attribute attribute the value, uh, attribute the user source and attach a value to those particular users. So basically, uh, the background for attribution as a, as a sort of separate piece of this puzzle is duplication. So it used to be so that you had all those ad networks already uh, and an advertiser uh, wanted, wanted to buy a user. So you don't know which network you're going to get the most users from. Uh, you need a lot of traffic, so you advertise over a lot of networks. And the problem would be that when you get an install, if I was a, if I was a player and I had clicked on any of uh, a number of ads and then finally had clicked on a, a single ad on any given network uh, which led to the install, all of these networks would claim it. Uh, just based on like a sort of post back from the, from the advertiser. And, uh, uh, here, of course, like uh, if I'm advertising 
for a game. I don't want to pay three times over for a single user. So it was costing a lot of money to people who were, who were doing really, really uh, active performance marketing. So the solution then was attribution. So basically industry standard rules, the ad click leading to the install, that is the advertising. That is the, the one who gets, gets the advertising money, money from the advertiser. So basically two ad networks, uh, one ad was clicked four days ago, but the player didn't install the game from the dad. Uh, but when they clicked uh, another ad on another network one day ago and installed the ad, the attribution uh, SDK will, uh, where there's a number of those products also available, the attribution SDK will then uh, attribute that install uh, to this partner. But uh, that's a nice bit for the advertisers. You're not paying double uh, for various networks. Um, and you know which network your traffic is coming from. So if, if uh, that guy came from uh, Nextage and that guy came from Inmobi and this guy is spending more money, you want to spend more money uh, with Nextage than Inmobi. Uh, so there's sort of three components here. So what attribution enables you uh, to do is to sort of predict to LTV, the lifetime value of, of players coming from any given network. So basically the only, only thing that the attribution does is it cleans up the source. You know where the player came from. Uh, you, you identify the user. Uh, then you need, need some intelligence there to really analyze their behavior. How much money they're spending? Uh, how much time they're spending? How many levels did they complete? Again, what are your crucial KPIs? Do you want people who stay with your game a long time? Do you want people who spend a lot of money? You can analyze and measure all of those things and, and then predict the LTV per user acquisition source. So you can optimize your spending on user acquisition uh, thanks to attribution uh, and buy the kind of players, the kind of traffic, the quality of players you want to. If you want to like just uh, you know reach the uh, uh, top of the uh, most downloaded uh, paid, uh, sorry, most downloaded like free app charts, then of course like you go for the cheapest source without caring a world about like, how much money you're going to make. But if you want to go for, for um, the maximum lifetime value, uh, maximum money spent, maximum total engagement of these players, then you need to analyze the sources carefully. And again, if we go uh, to the top 10 most grossing applications, they're, they're really like driving this, so basically think about this as a funnel where you acquire a large number of people uh, and uh, you try to retain, obviously, as, as many of them as, as possible. And retention is usually where we have the so-called K factor, uh, where, uh, where you know, people, loyal players bring in more loyal players. Like, I'm playing Clash of Clans, why don't you also like, start playing Clash of Clans and join my clan and, and then we attack people together or whatever. Uh, so basically, this is like where you then, you get your viral user sources, organic growth, and you get your paid acquisition, advertising, so forth. Then when you, you, you simply like uh, look at your monetization actions, how they're working, how much money you're making per user, and what is this sort of viral combined uh, LTV and combined acquisition cost? That, that then enables you to really make the decisions on where should you be buying more traffic. If you need more valuable customers, then you need to enhance monetization so you can make more money per customer, so you can invest that again in buying more valuable customers. It's easy. <laughs> and then um, engagement. So. Uh, uh, here, like the game content is obviously the key. Uh, something like Angry Birds had an insane retention uh, when sort of introducing new, uh, new, new levels, uh, new themes, new content, new birds. Uh, you had like a, like a ridiculous retention on existing <laughs> players. Uh, the only problem in that mechanic was that it wasn't really making money. It was, it was more of content marketing. Provide, keep providing uh, more content for that 99 uh, cent initial purchase so that those people will then go on and you know, spread the word that here's a game that provides an insane amount of content for, for a really, really cheap initial purchase. But nowadays you need to be a bit, bit smarter, especially if you want to keep people then spending money for more content. And you probably can't 
again, like the, the smaller your team, the smaller the business, you probably can't be publishing more content all the time, every week. Maybe you want to, like, like a monthly, monthly three week, monthly, uh, six week, two month cycle is really nice if you can bring like new episodes, new gameplay elements, new characters and so on. But in the meantime, you really need to be just driving like sort of simple engagement uh, actions. Like, how do you reward people for coming back every day or at least every week? Uh, give, them, give them different rewards, uh, enable some kind of prizes, discounts and so forth to keep them, keep them coming back. And this is something that you don't need to hard code things like this into the game. Think about these as, uh, as, uh, as advertising is, is, is simple HTML5 interstitials, so can be these. So these can be driven dynamically, dynamically online. Uh, and then retention. Um, retention, of course, uh, is, is uh, infinitely valuable because when somebody keeps playing your game, keeps spending money, uh, you're not spending anything to keep them there, right? So, so uh, think about sort of retention as uh, 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 if we think about so, uh, the fact that uh, I think right now the statistics is that like around 22% of people in any game uh, when, they, when they install it, whether it's from an app store or whether it's through an, through an ad, 22% never come back. They only like look at it once. And, and that's like a good result because uh, at some point it was like around 85% of people who only like, like launch a game once and never, never opened it again. Um, so if you can, anyone you can get, keep coming back like for, for more than one session, for more than one day, that's already a big win. Uh, all, and think about all the other traffic that you're buying into addition to that, retention is just money in the bank. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a saving activity. Uh, and, and then um, if we think about that, that sort of like how difficult it is to capture a player's or, uh, attention that they want to come back to your game every day. Uh, then there's also again tools like how do you reach how do you reach players when they're outside of the game? Uh, you can have them like for example sign up on an email newsletter. Uh, email marketing it's not very sexy, uh, but but it still works. And uh, I personally I've seen seen uh, uh, like for example email newsletter campaigns uh, for game updates. Uh, and, uh, and new game launches and so on, get like up to 30-35% up to 30, 30, uh, click-through rates and uh, like conversion rates upwards of 15%. Yes? What's the policy with Apple with uh, collecting email accounts? When is it allowed and when is it not? Uh, so in, in um, first of all you have to be, with Apple you have to be COPPA compliant. So, uh, so COPPA uh, the Children's Online uh, Protection Privacy Act in the US and then the Safe Harbor legislation in the EU, uh, they mandate uh, all data collection and privacy uh, regarding like minors, uh, I think under, under the age 13. Uh, so uh, what actually what a lot of people are doing nowadays uh, with any, any social features, uh, any, even Facebook Connect, uh, email newsletters and so on, you need to have some kind of age gate. So, so a lot of people are putting, putting like, for example, like simple puzzles and so on, and uh, age verifications. I, I think there's, for example, EA just released a game called Dungeon Keeper uh, on iOS and Android. And on Dungeon Keeper, a very controversial title <laughs> when, it, when it comes to monetization. Uh, but they have, like, for example, I think Facebook enabled chat, or maybe it's on their own server or so on. But if you want to go to the chat, you have to give your date of birth. Okay, if you're, data, if you're under 13, the chat will, you, you're, you're, you're blocked from the chat. Um, how they have implemented is that you can then go back a step and give another date of birth. So it's, it's not like, not like a, you know, at least they tried. So at least they put like a sort of minimum, minimum safeguard in there. But this is of course complicated, but this is something that we as, as uh, anybody, anybody who is in the, in the development and in this industry has to address in some way. Uh, we actually have a tool. We uh, at Playhaven we worked with um, with a number of companies uh, who make games 
uh, like exclusively for children as well. And uh, we worked with Nickelodeon on a, on a bunch of their children's titles. And we made like an age gate thing where any cross promotion, any marketing tool is like preceded with a, with a, with a simple maths calculation. So you have to be able to read uh, read the numbers and, and put them, do the, like the like simple calculations before you can access anything. And um, that wasn't even done uh, like before any COPPA or safe harbor regulation. So, so there's like these kind of responsible companies who want to, want to who think about the reputation and the user experience anyway, who, who want to take like a proactive, proactive stance on this. Okay, but you're allowed to do a pop-up like that that says that yes, you sign up for a new if you if you have like the age 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 gate there as well. So basically, in here you could, for example, you should have like a like let's say a, another field in the form uh, con like to confirm your date of birth. And basically, if if the if the date of birth if they're if they're under thirteen, you can store it. Uh, and and then of course like email email is something that's fully outside the game. But then there's um, push <coughs> notifications. So. Push notifications we know can be uh, sort of tied into the game actions. Like for example, let's say that there's a timer in the game, you're playing Candy Crush, you're out of lives, you get a notification 10 minutes later, 20 minutes, whatever later, that your, your lives have been filled and you should come back and, and crush some more candies. Uh, but they can be more, so they can also be segmented, targeted to different portions of the audience they can have like more value than just saying like, hey, your animals miss you, like come back to the farm. Uh, push notifications can be also used to di uh, guide people to, to claim their rewards, to, to, to get like special discounts. You can, you can have like whatever, if you have a holiday promotion in the game, uh, you can have a push notification that, that also like takes people, people back there. So uh, they, could, they can be more creative and, and uh, when they're really effective, uh, they can they can drive a lot of traffic and um, and always when it's more relevant when it's more targeted that's that's when all of this messaging is is more effective. Uh, and finally, in the toolkit, uh, I I think that this is like the correct order to discuss these always discuss these things. Uh, you need to first acquire the users, then you need to figure out like how are you going to keep them playing, like how why are they why are they interested in your game, and sort of monetization comes last. So. If you get the users, you will be able to monetize like one way or another. Um, so uh, monetization, of course, like it comes from in a free-to-play game, and it comes from game design. It comes from the game uh, uh, game content, and you you probably heard like from from game designers lecture before me, like how to make uh, efficient loops and how to how to like enable enable monetization in the gameplay. So on technology side. Uh, it, it can come from many, many, many things. So advertising, uh, advertising is of course like the biggest monetization source. Um, uh, if, we, if we're just looking at technology, uh, but here like the technology is enabling you to monetize. There's different uh, payment solutions, virtual currency solutions, uh, offer walls, a lot of ad <coughs> networks. Uh, there's, there's rich media ads. You can nowadays, uh, like right now, video is, is really big. So video has proven to be like a lot more efficient than the static interstitials in, in converting new users, getting more downloads. Um, and, um, and it's also uh, more valuable in monetization. So video ads uh, tend to generate right now uh, much higher, higher eCPM. Uh, so much better advertising revenue than static interstitials. But then w some people are already pushing for, for this. Uh, or, or there have been different rich media ad units available for quite a while now. But, but one thing that people are experimenting right now is this playables. So basically, like let's say King was a advertising Candy Crush in your game. And instead of um, a static interstitial, you get like one level, one small uh, three by three level of Candy Crush, where you like complete the level, and then that that takes you through to the download. Uh, so uh, people try to make like more engaging, more interactive, more interesting ad units all the time. Um, whether it's uh, whether it's it's like worth uh, investing in yourself, uh, advertising is is a, is a, is a is a game where. Like the creative part 
has a huge significance. Uh, like one banner might perform 30% uh, better than, than, than another banner, uh, e even with like exactly the same, same product, just a different creative approach. Uh, but then again, like creating a rich media ad unit of your game, that takes time, that takes resources, that costs money. Uh, whether it's that much more efficient, that's, that's again like something, something left for testing and should be again like data driven. How much time are you investing in, in, in advertising? So, uh, but anyway, uh, you, in advertising you always have like the supply side, which as a game developer, as somebody uh, making money is you. Because your game, uh, your sort of KPIs towards advertisers are how many, how many people do you have? But it's not really about the unique users, it's about how many game sessions do you run every day? Uh, and how many impressions, advertising impressions can you show in those games? Uh, that's, that's what's interesting to the advertisers and the ad networks. Uh, when you plug in uh, an ad SDK, and, and then you realize that, holy shit, that I have like 10,000, 15,000 daily unique users, but I'm not making any ad revenue. Uh, you're not driving enough sessions. You're not driving enough ad impressions uh, for those ad clicks to really convert in the sense where you'd be, you'd be creating enough, uh, enough value. Uh, and that's also like when, when, why, it, why it's going to be, you, you want to go to the ad networks and say like, get me more valuable advertising so that I can make more, get, generate more revenue out of my small inventory. But the ad, ad networks at the same time, they have people who are running millions and millions of impressions and sessions every day. So advertising really is a, is a volume game. Uh, it, if you have a, have a, have a small game, uh, you could have like 50,000 daily, daily unique users. It's probably smarter than to, if, if it's a free-to-play game, if, they, if those 50,000 loyal customers convert well uh, or even convert mildly, it might even make sense not to use advertising at all. Uh, but then of course, how do you increase that conversion? You might have like special offers, you might have discounts to your, your paying customers and so on. Uh, so that's, that's the real challenge. How do you take, uh, not like how do you storage, how do you transfer, how do you interpret the data, but then how do you solve this, this puzzle? How do you take the telemetry, how do you take all the data from your advertising uh, metrics, advertising performance, monetization performance, your most valuable acquisition channels, uh, your, which you have attributed. How do you take that data and when your product is, is running, when your product is finished, don't go and touch the product, but how do you dynamically manage each user's experience sort of along the way uh, in the game? Um, so basically like if you have a, if you have a drop off in your game, uh, for some reason, and, and it doesn't affect, like for example, all the users. Uh, it's somewhere there, you see that you lose like some segment of players. Maybe you lose all the left-handed people, I don't know. It, it can be like something, something that's completely un unanticipated. But still, like, you don't have to go and change the entire product. Maybe you have like, you know, some kind of information that you can provide dynamically that will at least alleviate the problem. Uh, make it make it like less of an less of an impact impact to your business. Do you have any questions at this point? Anything?
Yeah, so how do you sort of enable the data capture even from, a, from the real, really, really beginning of a, of a project? Yeah, and of course, like if you if you think if you go even like to the to the sort of simplest level of of paper, paper prototypes and uh, having like uh, some kind of focus group play just play around with your paper prototypes or so on. Uh, of course, like then then the tools for that is is just like hands on like focus group user testing. You put a video camera up there and you record what they're doing and then you take notes. But as soon as you, let's say you then say that, okay, our concept works on paper, uh, let's create an HTML5 minimum viable product and put it out on a browser and have, have like more people play it. Uh, let's make like a really simple, skin it really simple, let's make a, make a really simple game out of it and put it on Congregate or wherever, uh, what's the best, best uh, platform online to get, get people playing it. Uh, then you should already have like some kind of measurements in place. And often it's like this, uh, what I described is like sort of the, the sort of matrix, the puzzle of, of plugging everything in. Um, like, like the sort of more coherent uh, platform you can, you can think of. I, I think that you have to sort of think in, in like a, a contingency of that, okay, if I'm gonna need uh, like the product telemetry uh, for product development today, I am going to need the monetization uh, tools and so on uh, tomorrow or, or three months from now. So that like it's, it's good to sort of think that the, like this is not enough, that, that what do you need for the, like the end final product and the end package? Uh, you don't need to enable everything from, from day one, but how do you plug it in? Like, can you find like a platform that's, that's enough for your product where you, when it becomes more complex, when you add like different elements to it, when you start thinking of acquisition, for example, that you can just like switch on new pieces and new, new sort of data sources in there. But, but if you like, let's say that you, you uh, make your own data uh, analytics uh, for purposes of measuring three, four, five things. That works for you, but how do you then plug in, like if you, let's say, your main monetization model becomes uh, integrating a half a dozen different ad networks, for example. Do they all talk there? Do you, can you plug them in there? Do you have the time to develop uh, dashboards where you monitor yourself, like all those, all those networks and so on? So, uh, like, like, like um, I would say that even when you're in the paper prototype phase, you should sort of pay some, uh, you know, pay at least like a minute of thought to like, how are you gonna measure different things? And how are you gonna, how are you gonna lay it out in the, in the longer term? Uh, so uh, I would say that like, like nowadays it's commonplace to, to even when you put the MVP out, uh, you, you get at least like the basic metrics of retention, of, of usage, of time spent uh, playing and so on. Because that's how you then validate whether it's worthwhile uh, to go and develop it further. And of course like I'm only talking about like data driven development and business. Uh, if you want to make your game <laughs> that you enjoy making and love making, uh, then, then uh, you, you, you know, then, then data, data can help you, but, but if you don't want to base your, your development, your design on data, then yeah, that's okay. a different story. Yeah. 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 Oh, it is. It is. And especially if you try to like raise money, if you try to like build something up from scratch and raise like venture capital, like you yourself said that like, like taking a product to beta might cost already like 50,000 euros, whatever. If you don't have that 50,000 euros, you have to somehow 
either you have like some sugar daddy who, who really likes your concept sketches or something and is willing to go on that. But I would say that it's much safer, you're, you're much more like plausible to get some proper venture capital if you have the numbers to back it up that, hey, I actually have a concept that will have traction. All right, but yeah, like then uh, setting this up, like data becomes one of your biggest assets because that's like the knowledge of your users. That's if, even if your product fails, you're, you're collecting like a, like a huge amount of valuable data of how do people spend time. Uh, if, if like, let's say your monetization failed and your game didn't make any money, but you had like a ridiculously high engagement and retention on like the core loop of the game. Uh, when you go to make your next game, this becomes like, like hugely valuable uh, uh, findings and validation for at least like part of your design and your thinking. Uh, but then this is a huge investment, this infrastructure. And I'm not saying this because I work for a, for a service provider in this industry. But the fact is that, and this is by the way Google's data center in my lovely hometown of Hamina, and this is only the cooling pipeline, so this isn't even the actual hardware. Uh, so basically, uh, big companies are thinking that, okay, data is valuable, we have our data, we want to own our data. Uh, so we want to set up our own analytics because nobody offers the granularity we need to really measure what we want whenever we want and so on. But this can add up, developing something like this can take a number of years. You're going to end up having like uh, 12 people working minimum on, uh, 12 engineers working on something like this for a year or two and you're going to end up spending a lot of money. Uh, so this is like a... I think that like uh, building the infrastructure should be a similar approach as your other business. Like where, what is the return on investment? Uh, when you're thinking about like setting up your own analytics infrastructure, uh, building it up from scratch, developing your own backend, uh, putting together your own cloud solutions, everything. Uh, and then what, what's the return? How do you recoup that investment? And, and most commonly you can think that, okay, if I'm taking all this effort to build this up, then I can offer it to other developers for a fee. But then so do like all the service providers in the industry, and so does everybody, every other developer who are developing their own backend. They're thinking exactly the same. So it's a, it's a hugely competitive field as well. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's, I would say that like in, in, in Finland, we can find like server architects and we can find like a database expert and so on to work on this. But if your business was based, for example, let's say in San Francisco or Silicon Valley, there the industry becomes like super competitive. So you won't even find the people to execute something like this because they're already working for Google and for, for, for um, uh, proprietary like data companies or Oracle or wherever. Uh, but yeah, building the infrastructure another business development that should be dictated by data. Is it worth your investment? Is it really like worth the focus of your company? Uh, but why does this then like, let's say you make all the provisions, you put together an infrastructure where you're measuring the right things with the right tools uh, and they're nicely tied into the right tools to take action. So you can see that, okay, I made, um, uh, there's like a, like a dip in revenue, uh, and I can see from here that it's, it's because my advertising revenue has gone down, but I can refocus and use different advertising networks to drive it up again. Uh, when you enable a chain like this uh, across like all of these functions of acquisition, monetization, uh, so forth, you're, you're, going, you're really aiming for the win. And this kind of process compared to like just looking at things separately and changing one thing at a time uh, in one interface or one dashboard or wherever or changing the product, uh, this, this just brings more efficiency across the whole process. So, so your decision making process becomes more educated when you have more access to a broader set of data. Uh, all of this uh, use of analytics and reports becomes more effective when you're not cross-referencing a lot of different data but you have everything at hand and content creation becomes more economical because when you have access to the data, when it's there like right in your face, you know what you're supposed to be doing. So you don't end up like trying, trying to fix the problems, but you're acting on knowledge. You're acting on, on, on all the signals there. And what's the most important part? 
the user experience becomes more personal because you're addressing uh, actual facts, you're addressing user behavior that you measured. So it becomes more personal, uh, it becomes more engaging, hopefully leads to better retention and so forth. Uh, so, uh, as, 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 as you can uh, see, this is, this is like a, quite the field of different things. If we think about even like a, uh, acquisition and attribution uh, as an example, those two things you can spend a lot of time optimizing. And then if we think about then the post-install activities of keeping the players, retaining the players, keeping them really engaged, uh, this can all be super time consuming. It's much, too much work for one person. But the, uh, the ability to act uh, on all of these sort of phases of the user life cycle based on data, it's, it's uh, enabling then something, something much better in the future. So this is, this is some of this is just like sort of predictive fluff. Uh, but this is like why the industry is heading into this, this direction, that when we're enabling uh, much more thorough use of data across the whole, whole uh, product life cycle, uh, user lifetime, um, we're of course like creating more tasks, sort of more micromanagement, more communications per user. Uh, but what can we do then next? How can we make this, make this better from there? When we enable it, how do we make it better? Uh, when basically like, uh, why, we, why this is based on data is because predicting the future is incredibly hard. What's going to be the number one game in 20, 2015? And here's a good example from the turn of the 19th century where a French artist like envisioned what a school will look like in 2000, year 2000. So there's a professor here crunching big data and uh, beaming it into these pupils' heads. And uh, you know, in a way like this is, uh, you could think of this as e-learning or something that, that like the concept is there, but the execution is a bit different. And uh, this relates directly to market behavior, market analysis of, of how consumers will, what, what the consumer needs and wants will be, let's say 18 months from now. And here's a good example. In 2007, when the iPhone launched, uh, an agency called Universal McCann, they conducted a global media study where they interviewed 10,000 people and uh, they came to the conclusion that there's no real need for a convergent product in the US, Germany or Japan. And they tried to estimate how successful will the iPhone be uh, in the Western world, in emerging markets and so on. And their findings indicated that nobody wants to buy an iPhone because everybody in the US, Germany or Japan who is an affluent consumer already has a really nice digital camera they have the best cell phone money can buy and they have iPods. So why would they buy another like mediocre product that combines like these in, into some kind of whatever. Uh, whereas like people on the emerging markets were ecstatic like hey like I can only spend so much money so if I can get it like all in one device that's great. Uh, but of course we know what happened it became like much more of a word of mouth status symbol like uh, like iPhone when it came out it was like the Apple Mac crowd designers phone uh, before it then like became just a standard like sort of really commonplace smartphone uh, but but it's the same when we're developing games we don't know we can't go to like uh, like uh, interview 10,000 people and ask what kind of game exactly do you want to play and, and they will say one thing and, and then when you de keep developing that game they're, they're busy playing, playing Flappy Bird and you just had like no idea what happened to the market. Uh, and our, our sort of, um, uh, again, like it's a luxury that we can measure and see what people like, what they're most engaged with and respond to that like almost in real time in, in product development. Uh, we don't have to look at, we don't have to think about that what the hell are people going to like 18 months from now. We can look at like what is like keeping them playing right now and respond to that. And, and we can make predictions based on their behavior to like four weeks from now, not, not like six months, 18 months from now. And, and these predictions can be pretty accurate. So uh, we like to think that like 2015, next year already, we can make a lot of this process automated. So this is a bit ominous. This is like a Terminator way of saying it, that big data becomes autonomous. But, but basically like uh, when we model big data, uh, when we um, 
when we do like data mining queries and, and start modeling user behavior, we can, we can get to like an automated process where we programmatically acquire users from different sources, bucket them uh, per their lifetime value thanks to attribution, and then as they proceed in the game, they get served with a different experience. Uh, when they are not paying customers, maybe they get like, like uh, shown advertising somewhere along the way. If they're paying customer, they sort of automatically go into a promotion cycle, which should never be like something that's like made to milk the paying customers, but which should be uh, more of a, think about it as a loyalty program. You're spending money, you're enjoying the game, so you get added bonuses, you get exclusive content, you get discounts that other people don't get. Uh, but then to not have like you or somebody else pushing that button and enabling these campaigns and content and so on. This is the end goal, to really like automate, automate this process, automate these actions. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's like the sort of nice starting point is to make the big data actionable and, uh, and, uh, and uh, aim, aim for automation from there. Uh, any questions at this point? It has heavy developers gathered on this monolith of wisdom. So they're evolving to the next level. So this is, this is like sort of the second portion. So, so some, of the, some of the sort of lifetime value thinking here, and then, then look at like a couple of case studies of, of what kind of results uh, developers have driven like using, using sort of segmented approach to, to, to doing marketing actions, actions uh, with the users. Uh, so, again, uh, like the players, they don't just like come into the game and play the game and that's it. But with a free-to-play game, it's a service. It's a life cycle. They play the game, uh, they get more engaged with it, some of them spend money on it, and then they, then they exit the game eventually or go to another game. So how do you, where do you find the players, uh, how do you keep them engaged, and how do you bring them back uh, fra after they left the game? And uh, as we just looked, uh, there's so many things how you can measure these things. And then how you, what kind of mechanisms you build to then actually bring them back, uh, how to enhance, uh, maximize this time and value that they spend with your game. That's a different story. Um, so again, uh, something like Rovio, uh, built on paid applications, built on cross-promotion, uh, going to free-to-play, free-to-play is where the value is, uh, and anybody has a guess of what this number is? 400,000 to about 1 million. Anybody? Yes, so this is the daily installs required today to reach the number one iTunes app store rank for free apps. So that's, uh, and you need positive reviews for that as well because it, there's an algorithm that, that takes, takes into account like whether your application is crap or not. But it fluctuates quite a lot depending on what's on offer and uh, day of the week as well. People are much more engaged, much more active on the App Store uh, during the weekend. Uh, but let's say you're doing user acquisition at $2 a, a head and you want to give, be number one uh, free application any given day. Uh, that's a big investment. So obviously like, uh, where we want to focus is then retention, uh, keeping as many players as engaged as possible and spending money. Uh, this, is, this, is la this is a really tough game to, to really go there and, and try to get, uh, get, get to number one on, on, on paid acquisition alone. Uh, so uh, this is this is actually actually US. So the big question then becomes like, what is a customer worth? Like if it's if it's like a ridiculous amount of money uh, that you need to spend uh, to be on top of those charts, if you want to be on top of those charts, what are those customers actually worth? How much money should you spend to acquire? And to retain these customers. Retention can also be, be costly, uh, depending on what kind of actions you take. And of course, like good old days, you could look at this as costs. Uh, and if your costs, development costs, marketing costs, were smaller than the revenue you were generating, you're profiting. Premium business model, where you have the price of admission, you have the single purchase, 
and most importantly all the customers are equal so basically you're addressing broadcasting to like a, a sort of homogeneous mass of, of audience and those people who are part of your user segment who are interested they pick up on your broadcast and, and pay, pay that singular price and today customer uh, no longer equals transaction so customer becomes a relationship so free in free-to-play business model you have a period of time and you interact with each customer who plays your game to build a relationship uh, and uh, then we, we start closing in on this customer lifetime value uh, LTV and uh, how do we measure the LTV? Uh, you can actually like do a lot of really interesting forecasting uh, just, just based, on, based on mathematical functions so for example in, in traditionally, you know, let's say you're running a coffee shop and you're serving like a number of customers who are coming back a number of times and spending an X amount of money on product. So you can then uh, start forecasting a remaining customer lifetime uh, over like their, their life cycle. And then next, you can start forecasting the future revenues based on estimation of future products purchased and price paid. And then you have an estimation included of costs for delivering uh, those future products. And then finally you can calculate the net present value of the future amount. And like if you ask me, like, like is this something that you should be, is this an exercise that you should be spending your time on? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it is like, like in, in this extent. So you don't, you don't have to be this guy to think about like how do you want to build relationship and engagement on um, uh, on your on your customer base? Uh, it's it's not like a, like when we're talking about measurement, it really comes down down to boiling your analytics down to those key key performance indicators for your business, so that you're not entangled in in some kind of like really really like like trivial trivially detailed uh, calculations of what might it cost uh, to get new users uh, six months from now and how much you might extract from those those users specifically so you're building a relationship uh, as a marketer and relationship is communication so how do we want when we're customers when we're playing games how do we want uh, uh, the, the publisher, the, the proprietor of that business to treat us? So we want to have like a nice two-way communication where we have a nice relationship, we get a good overall service uh, instead, of, instead of having like some kind of one-way street where something is being pushed to us uh, all the time on a, on a loudspeaker. So then we become uh, closer to user segmentation. So if we want to be uh, the guy on the left uh, uh, and if we want to address the guy on the left how do we make sure uh, that we're speaking to them and we're not not giving them the experience here on the right that we want to avoid <coughs> so addressing different people with different relevant messaging how would we group people how do we define segments uh, if we want to customize our our marketing messaging notifications communications how do we group people so basically it boils down to customers who do something, act in some way, uh, spend some amount of money and so on, tend to do something else. They, customers who spend a lot of time with your game tend to spend a lot of money in your game. If you can equal like this kind of behavioral patterns, you can divide your users into a segments, into different user groups. And this... Um, understanding like these segments and and what kind of people these segments uh, consist of where do they come from it really helps you better serve serve your customers so not all of these players are created equal uh, first of all they come from different cultures they come from different geographic regions uh, all of which have like a, like a different characteristics whether it's just something as simple as language but it can also be what kind of devices are prevalent? What kind of mobile devices people are using? using uh, what's the, what's, is Android dominant or iOS? Uh, are people using more tablets or more phones? Like where is the value coming from? How much money are these people spending on? Are they spending a lot of money? Are they part of like your tiny core of players who spend a lot of money, a lot of um, 
uh, resources on the game, or are they just casual players? Are they somewhere in the middle? And then there's also the function of time. Uh, is like a person who's spending maybe more time on your game and inviting friends to it to play it, is, is that person more valuable to you than just an individual customer who's spending a lot of money in the long term? So again, uh, come back to these like variables of how do you group people into user cohorts, into user groups? Uh, like people who start playing, if your game has been out now for six months and it's, it's uh, gone through like a development life cycle of monthly updates, for example, people who download it today and start playing, playing it today have a very different uh, experience than people who played it uh, six months ago. They have a very different set of expectations of what's coming next, next what kind of content, what kind of experience, uh, are they how, many, uh, how are they going to spend their money on. Somebody who started like playing the first iteration on your game, uh, they basically like had like some, some updates to look forward to. And they were spending like resources on a limited number of things and then waiting for you to develop more things. Somebody who starts playing your game now, much later, they have like a ton of things that they can purchase and it's going to take them a lot of time to get and resources to get there. So they even have like a different expectation of how the game is going to play out for them. So uh, not only like demographics, but also user cohorts. Uh, when did they start playing the game? Did they already lapse and come back to the game? Is this like a sort of somebody who's giving the game a second chance and, and so on? All of these people have, have different, different behavioral patterns. And just like, you know, just in, in, in like some general uh, statistics from the market, uh, people like Fixu, uh, Distimo, App Annie, they give out a lot of, lot of relevant data. They give out like monthly reports of the state of the app market on iOS, on Android. Uh, they give out like tidbits of information on how the best titles are performing. Uh, but also stuff like, <laughs> like this, like these are pretty general statistics that 95 to 99% of, of customers never make in-app purchases. Uh, are you going to ignore that fact and focus on the people who actually spend money? Or do you also want to like, you know, provide for some sort of monetization mechanics, advertising, uh, something different for, for this part of audience? Uh, up to or more than 50% only play once and never return. How do you get them back? How do you give them, how do you, how do you sort of uh, pull them in if they just tried it and yeah, like make it made a snap judgment, but they still might be interested. Is it possible to retarget them and get them back in? Uh, Non-payers play mobile games roughly around four hours per week and high spenders 12 hours a week. So there's a huge, huge difference there in, uh, in time spent on games in general. And of course, if it's a high spender spending a lot of time on games, you want them to spend that on your game. And, and not the next guys. So did you uh, these sources? Uh, sorry. Uh, so for example, uh, Distimo and App Annie, and then uh, a user acquisition company called Fixu. Fixu. Fixu, yeah. So so those those guys they put out like uh, pretty much like monthly or uh, monthly newsletters and a lot of infographics <laughs> and so on. A uh, lot of lot of different different usage data and uh, and just general like app app intelligence, and of course like when your business grows big enough that you want to do like a thorough competitor analysis, uh, these are also app and Distimo. They're also companies that give you like a really really detailed insight on how your competition is doing. So they have they have like a lot of analytics on app stores alone. How many how many downloads are being uh, how many downloads of each game are there all the time, over time, and how much revenue those, those games are uh, estimated uh, to generate. Uh, so uh, when we think about segments um, and, and this life, player life cycle and lifetime value, we can think of it as, um, as this sort of uh, engagement curve. And of course, like this curve will change a lot, like radically depending on the player segment uh, uh, and um, and, and how they, what's their behavior uh, in, the, in the game? What's their purchase, purchase history and activities and so on? So for example, let's say that the paying customer comes into the game 
So day one, when they download the game, uh, they start from scratch in, in terms of like engagement. Uh, an engagement value here, this is just a simplified graph of sort of compound time slash money spent on game. Uh, and then, then, then uh, like, like over a period of time. So a person comes into the game, downloads the game, and we remember that like majority of players might not come back. It's that one session, that one chance you have there. So maybe you can reward them just for downloading the game. Like, hey, thanks for checking this game out. Here's 50 free credits for you, like go crazy. Uh, and um, of course, like uh, a, a point of controversy is here. Like, how do you capture the user's data on the very first session so that if they never try it again, if they even forget about the game, you can reach back out to them. And it's like, you know, if you go on a first date, uh, you don't ask the other person to change their Facebook status, that, hey, now we're dating. Uh, so it's, it's like a point of controversy of, uh, of how much can you ask? Like, do you want to, like, like, hey, like you just downloaded the, ga downloaded the game. Now sign up. Like, now give me your email. Now, now uh, log in with Facebook. And uh, it's usually a good idea to, to give it like, a, like, a, like, like somehow ease the player into the fact that, uh, that there's, there's like a bonus or some kind of boon for them to, to sign up and, and register with the game. There's a lot of different uh, publishers, like for example, like Dina and Mobage, Mobage uh, where they, um, they, uh, they have like a mandatory sign on, like create a profile before you can even, even try the game. And, we can we can be like be like pretty pretty sure that that there's a big drop off there with with any casual players already. So uh, when you have the player sort of east east into the game with rewards and so on, if they start uh, spending money making purchases, then you should focus on like how do you again like not like how do you milk the player, how do you extract the highest possible dollar value. But what's the best service for a paying customer? Uh, is it discounts? Is it some kind of special offers? Uh, some kind of exclusive uh, products, content, gifts? Uh, and at some point, of course, like the engagement with the game as well as the spending will peak eventually. It might be like further in the future, nearer in the future. They might not get that engaged at all. Uh, and it starts to go down. So I play the game for uh, three weeks and I spend a lot of money on my second week in the game. I spend some money on my third week, I'm on my fourth week and I'm, I don't intend to spend any money. Except what do I, if I get like a super special offer, if I get uh, something, something that's just like too good to pass. Uh, if I get something exclusive, something new that wasn't there before. Uh, that, that might nudge me again uh, to spend more time keeping more engaged with the game. Uh, and then eventually, when I'm not spending a significant amount of uh, time or money with the game anymore, then it's a good idea to cross-promote other games. So if you have more than one game in your portfolio, uh, cross-promote uh, your users to another game where you can then hopefully like you have the chance of resetting like this curve in another, t uh, another title altogether. And then uh, monetizing with ads when there no, there's no spending, spending at all happening. And of course, like for somebody who's not spending any money, you might start monetizing them with advertising from uh, the fifth session or uh, the third day or, or so on. Uh, a lot of people do very aggressive monetization on ads. So you download a new game, you fire it up, you haven't even started your first session, and boom, there's an interstitial ad for you. Uh, for me personally, that's just like bad form. Like, like what's like, is your game is not worth playing, so you're already cross-promoting me uh, to another game. So it's always a good idea, like, not to go too aggressive, uh, with, not to go like overboard with the, with the advertising. But then again, like, now we come back to like, what are the KPIs of advertising business? Number of sessions, number of impressions. If you have a lot of downloads, and for every download, you, you might think it's cynical, but every download, uh, everybody opens up the game, that's one session and that's one impression in the bag. So <laughs> it's, it's again like uh, for me, every time you see somebody do it, you download a game and you see an ad on the first session, that's somebody really, really cranking up and maximizing on their advertising revenue. Because those ads, they also convert. Okay, 
so if if the secret here is to during the whole lifetime in the game to have meaningful and targeted messages for the players what what is a meaningful and targeted message and that of course depends on the segment so uh, for somebody who's not going to spend any money they just come for like freebies and so on they get a reward and that's that's uh, something that keeps them coming back keeps them playing and the value of those customers is then virality and then potentially spreading the word uh, getting you getting you more players organically uh, for a big spender, it might be that discount campaign. They, they came back because there's like a weekend offer that they get 50% of a purchase that they, they, they've been like sort of waiting to make. Uh, and of course, this kind of like premium offers, they're not for everybody. Like somebody who never spent any money on the game, they're probably not going to spend $10 or $20 uh, just because you have like a special one-time thing. But then somebody who's habitually spending uh, weekly, monthly, uh, I like to think of it as good service. That if you have like a special offer, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a question of balance. Uh, are you offering a good service or are you, think, are you exploiting the player? And I think that like anybody who's designing this economy, who's looking at the, the behavior of the users, uh, can balance this, can really like balance this out. What's a good service? Uh, think about it as uh, like, for example, like an airline. You, you, you fly a plane to New York, you get air miles, you get points. You can get free, free you can get like, uh, like use those points to, to add value. You can upgrade your next flight or so on. So I like to think of like providing discounts, uh, providing this kind of value for paying customers in a similar way. You know, think of it as a as a loyalty program, uh, and not not as like maximizing your revenue. Yes. That's a very good question. So there's 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 a that's actually that's like a point of contention where. Some people say never offer discounts because people will then you will teach people to wait for discounts and uh, and they will only like make those purchases at that lower price. And then a second point is that do discounts do they add to retention? Do they improve retention? Uh, or, or do they actually decrease retention? Like like it, does the perceived value become lower? Uh, there's for example. Uh, in these glue games where this gold is, is, uh, is, um, is a hard currency, uh, it becomes, no sorry, the gold is soft currency, but then they have like glue coins, which is, which is the hard currency. Like the logic dictates that, uh, that uh, if you sell people hard currency, they're much more plausible to come back to spend that hard currency. It's like anybody who had an Xbox uh, Gold, uh, uh, Xbox Live account here, you have those Xbox points, and they were sold at increments, which made it impossible to like spend them to zero. So you would always like be buying more Xbox points to, to sort of fill the gap to buy a new Xbox Live game. And it was like supremely annoying to have 700 points hanging on your account and not being able to spend them on what you want. I mean, that's, that's like, a, that's like one, one sort of strategy there. Uh, so, but then, then again, you could think of that, is that then like exploiting people? Uh, but what... Uh, then like in the discount strategy you can think that like what is it that you will discount is there always going to be like for example like money only iaps or always going to be like hard currency items where you only like discount certain types of things so i i think that uh, this is again like like depending on the game this is a point for experimentation and uh, analysis and and that what i just mentioned about the retention like, like whether discounts improve retention or, or decrease from it. There's, uh, there's from a couple of titles, there's, there's like a bit of differentiating, uh, different evidence actually, that in some cases, uh, discounts could be seen like as sort of jumping the shark and, and, uh, and uh, saying that, okay, that this, this game is just now not valuable anymore. But in some cases, like discounts are seen as extremely favorable and people buy a discounted item and come back more, more than they did before. So, uh, did you, you had Aki, Aki here from Grand Crew, and, and Aki, Aki, I think, uh, has a very nice, elegant point on free-to-play design, that free-to-play should accommodate for whales. If there's like a whale, somebody who likes to spend a lot of money, and if they can afford it, why not let them? But your business should never depend 
on, on uh, uh, exploiting the whales or, or leaning on like those, those consumers and those users who, who, who spend like huge amounts of money. Uh, First of all, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it can be seen as extremely unethical. And secondly, uh, when those people finally decide to go away from your game, you're dead. Because they are, if they become your main source of revenue. So here's like some tips and best practices from our users. Like how do you then spread out, how do you engage like your entire user base effectively? Uh, these, have, these are like things that uh, uh, different developers have used and have actually seen, seen move the needle for them uh, on the revenue side. Uh, so for example, like that IAP strategy and discounts, uh, there's a developer called Mobile Deluxe. Uh, they make uh, slot machine games, uh, social casino games and so on uh, for iOS and Android. And uh, they did a discount campaign where they uh, segmented their users according to their spending. So <coughs> non-spending customers, people who had spent a low amount of money, uh, some, some more, and then like the big spenders who have spent like upwards of, of $50 and so on. And for each of these segments, they drove uh, like differently scaled discounts. So uh, the lowest tier non-paying customers got like a $3 value pack for 99 cents special offer. And then the highest spending customers, everybody got like a significant 25-30% uh, discount uh, depending on the size of the package. But everybody got like sort of uh, the appropriately scaled uh, uh, purchase. And what happened was that first of all, of the non-paying customers targeted, 50% of them made, the, made their first purchase. So they saw that the discount and one time only offer and 50%, half of the non-paying customers converted on that, that special offer, made their first purchase. And overall, across all of the segments, they saw like an average of 175 to 250% increase in purchase conversions. So basically, if you're offering uh, 25 to 30% discounts and you're effectively doubling your sales, that's, that's uh, in my opinion, good, good mathematics on, on this strategy. And here, like the considerations obviously are, as you said, uh, like uh, is this affecting like then the future purchases negatively or positively? Uh, is this affecting engagement positively, negatively? Uh, these are then things that when you're thinking of discounts, when you're thinking of this kind of tiered strategy, you need to measure this and, and probably you can, uh, not probably, you want to measure it according to each tier. Where, does this, where do these discounts apply? Like, did those first time purchasers, did this lead to then a second purchase at the normal price or at another discount price and so forth? Uh, this is like, um, uh, for people who, who say that like, uh, uh, that this doesn't, like, like say, talk in sort of absolute terms that this doesn't work, that this isn't valuable. I like to think of like a comparison with um, uh, just, uh, just like uh, online retail. Think about e-commerce. Why do we do price comparisons online? And how does like, for example, like Amazon, you go to Amazon and you look at the product and it shows you that, hey, you can actually buy this, this product used at a cheaper price or you can buy it from Amazon Marketplace new for a cheaper price. So this kind of thinking uh, where you actually get offered like something that you're already looking for. This, are, this is not like reinventing the wheel. This is just games and these in-game stores as our sort of medium and marketplace, marketplace on this. So uh, again, um, this kind of thing should be driven by data. So you, you do campaigns, you see what works uh, and, and you act accordingly. You understand your users better and if you get negative results from something like a discount campaign, then you never do discounts again, or you do them in a, in a different fashion. Uh, and then secondly, building relationships outside of the game. Uh, email marketing, as I said earlier, it's, 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 it can be effective. It's not like the, like the hottest topic ever. Uh, I think that the, like why it's still significant and why it's even like probably more significant than before is that if we look at something like Facebook, um, maybe like three, four years ago, it made sense to build 
community on Facebook and really like trying to gather those page likes and, uh, and people on your page. Because you could post on that page and probably most of those users could see those posts. But not so uh, anymore. Now you pretty much have to, if you want to reach like even 15-20% of your page likes, of your community on Facebook, you have to pay to promote those posts. And even promoted posts are then competing with other promoted posts in, in those users' news feeds. Uh, so Facebook, in, uh, in my opinion, in gaming has become much more of a user acquisition platform in terms of uh, advertising in the news feed, but less, less effective as a community platform. It's good to have there, but it should like reflect all the content that you're creating and promoting. Uh, whereas like an email newsletter, it's, it might not be like the absolutely most effective uh, uh, communication channel. You might not get like huge conversion rates there, but at least that's still personal. And you're, when you're sending out an email uh, newsletter, you can measure how many people opened it and you, you have like very accurate data of, of reach and how many people like uh, opened, engaged and clicked your, your, your messages, your communications. So uh, Sega, for example, Sega used this kind of like data gathering tool where they asked people to sign up for a newsletter to keep up with, uh, with, uh, with Sonic, Sonic games in mobile. And they had a game out called um, Sonic Dash, an endless runner. Oh, sorry, Sonic Jump was the, was the first game. And uh, they asked people to sign up um, uh, to this email newsletter. And they got uh, hundreds of thousands of signups. They increased their total reach on their users in mobile 66% in, in this like mobile arcade category. Uh, and when they launched Sonic Dash, this was like their first point of communication, sending out a notification on email to all of these people to go download the new game. And if you think that their, maybe their overall reach, I, I don't know what it was exactly, but it was like around half a million. If you convert those people at a 10% open rate, a 20% uh, um, click-through rate, maybe 10% conversion rate, they have 50,000 downloads for the new game like that. And sending out those emails costs peanuts uh, compared, to, compared to acquiring 50,000 users at cost from, from mobile user acquisition sources. Uh, then uh, uh, Fish Labs. Fish Labs is actually an excellent studio, ran into a bit of financial problem. Uh, they were acquired by Koch Media, but they're finally this year coming out with this game called uh, Galaxy on Fire Alliances. Pretty ambitious game. Uh, it's like a massively multiplayer online uh, hardcore sci-fi strategy game for iPads. So that's, that's quite a mouthful. And um, <laughs> if you try, even try to do paid acquisition for a title that's this niche, like, like uh, if you would go now, you would launch a game today and go acquire users. It's, it's much cheaper, it's much easier to, to acquire users for a racing game for an arcade game, for even for a first-person shooter. If you have a mid-core strategy game, you have fantasy and dragons, you have spaceships and, and explosions, it gets much, much more difficult. Because how the advertising networks work in gaming especially, uh, gaming, games tend to be promoted within genres of games. So if you play endless runners, you're going to see a lot of ads for other endless runners. Because obviously you're playing endless runners, you enjoy more playing more endless runners and, and sort of arcade games. So then something like this gets advertised to mid-core strategy players uh, who are already like super engaged with those titles. So it's, it's a much bigger leap for them to download that game and therefore you get a really low conversion. So you're going to spend a lot of money on, on uh, getting a very, very small number of users out of acquisition networks. So they uh, turn to cross promotion. They have like a sort of triple A value um, uh, space, space shooter simulation called Galaxy on Fire. And uh, they've got like 90% of their, their uh, I think, I think 30,000 plus beta testers for this game just from in game messaging. So they send out in-game messages and notifications in their existing games and hey, we have a new game coming out, uh, it's in soft launch, we're doing an, a closed beta, 
So come and download it from here. Okay, th then you have to figure out like how do you how do you manage the distribution of of the beta game to the beta testers and so on. But but again, when they finally when they launch the new game, uh, it, they sub, they're going to launch it of course like through the app stores. They're going to have tens of thousands of beta testers who they can communicate directly with, and ha again have tens of thousands of free downloads uh, on on day one uh, for the new game. So basically, again, lowering user acquisition costs by finding the right channels where to get the people from into, into the game. Uh, then push notifications, it sort of touched already on the fact that like, it's not all just your, your animals miss you and, and your lives have been fulfilled or somebody's attacking your village. Uh, but relevant push notifications can drive up to 50% of daily active users. So uh, this is usually measured in like 24 hour period. Uh, of course, like can't really tell like how many people of the sort of long tail would have launched the uh, game anyway. Uh, but what we've seen is uh, up to 50% of daily active users of a single game came to the game, launched the game uh, by acknowledging a push notification. Uh, so how, how can they be relevant? First of all, uh, they can be targeted, again, according to user segments. So for example, think of a push notification as a sort of reactivation tool for lapsed players. So you think of your players in segments and cohorts. Somebody who downloaded the game three weeks ago uh, played it really actively, had a lot of weekly sessions, daily sessions on the first week, second week, third week, spent a lot of money. But they haven't played for the last five, six, seven, eight days. So why did they lapse and how can you reactivate them? And they're probably not going to reactivate by a notification saying like, please come back. But what if you can actually like give them some kind of relevant content? Like for example, like, like there's a discount waiting for them or a reward where if they actually activate, the, uh, acknowledge the push notification, they get gameplay content, they get a the reward, they get uh, something special for coming back. And again, uh, like think about it that that you're not like sending a push notification for everybody every hour every day to come back to the game But only target those cohorts those lapsed segments like people who were super active But for some reason haven't come back for a while. Maybe they just sort of um, You know, maybe they're actually deleted your game and they're not there anymore uh, But maybe they just sort of um, for some reason found another game and and didn't almost forgot to come back Maybe you still have the opportunity to activate them and why is it valuable to try to reactivate them again is cost. The cost of sending a single push notification, the cost of sending a single uh, email, it's, it's, it's minimal, it's, it's tiny compared to cost of paid user acquisition. Uh, then rankings and ratings, uh, these are calculated nowadays uh, from since last uh, autumn into App Store. Uh, this, this, this applies to, to the iTunes App Store on App, uh, Apple, Apple App Store. Rankings and ratings are calculated into, into uh, reviews and ratings are calculated into the App Store rankings. So basically, if you, even if you get like huge virality, you, you launch Flappy Bird and it becomes a huge success. If everybody, it gets a huge uh, volume of, um, of downloads in a short period of time, but everybody thinks that this is crap and, and gives it a one star rating, it's gone. It's not going to be there. It's not going to probably even go to number one, and it's going to sink really fast because it's it, of those poor ratings factoring into the into the actual results. So another strategy that you can do here is again segmentation. Who are the people? Who is who in your audience is most plausible to give you the most favorable ratings? And that's probably your most engaged. Uh, most engaged, biggest spending, uh, most involved uh, players and customers. So it's probably not somebody who spends dozens of sessions every week on your game who's going to say that I hate this game, it's ruining my life. But if they're, even if they're saying that, they're still going to give it five stars. Like, like in the case of Flappy Bird. Did anyone actually play it though? What's, a, what's your high score? 12. 12? Yeah. Interesting. 65, but I'm on Android. <laughs> Um, and then again, like coming back to this example, keep the content relevant. So again, for somebody, a good game experience uh, is, is getting discounts. For somebody like 
not really like getting like how to do something, how to achieve a goal in the game is ruining the game experience. So you can give tips, you can give like find those segments, like find what's blocking people from keeping really engaged and try to resolve them, not by reinventing the game and making a huge change into the game mechanics by giving advice, uh, giving like relevant uh, messaging and, and information to the players. And generosity always works. So my, my favorite like uh, example of generosity was when Spotify was launched. And it was really uh, hard. It was actually you needed like an invitation to get into Spotify, but it was like the end of the rainbow. There was like free music. And when it was launched, there was no advertising, there was nothing. But it spread like wildfire because it was exclusive. So everybody wanted to get in, submitted their emails, signed up to like give me invitation now, give it now. And then they started like sending out like huge batches of those invitations. And as we all know, eventually they got tens of millions of paying customers out of, um, out of that user base. And you could argue that the same logic applies. Like, People come back to Angry Birds time after time just because there's for free content, there's more levels, there's more stuff to play for for free. Like like you you paid 99 cents for Angry Birds, you're still playing it a year and a half ago because there's new episodes, new cool free stuff. Uh, what if you're not spending on a free to play game? Uh, why do you come back? Like maybe you get like some allocation of currency, maybe you get some freebies that still keep you interested in it and eventually might even lead up to you actually spending real money, actually buying currency in the game. So again, like, like giving stuff to good customers, to loyal customers, to engage customers, it, it could prove to be a valuable strategy. And of course, keep in touch with people. Get, get their email addresses, uh, get them to like your Facebook uh, community, sort of even if you're not reaching all of them. You're making, making like a connection where you have your players come to you and, and like you can reach them through email, through Facebook, through Twitter, uh, through push notifications, through different, different channels. Sort of maximize the opportunity to find them when they're, when they're not in the game or, or when they're lapsed for some reason. So what's, what's a customer worth? Really depends on the game, depends on the individual customer segment, but still uh, if we're not putting a dollar value on it, we can say that they have many different values. They have like a value of spreading the word, word of mouth. They have a dollar value of their spending, but they're really worth of this relationship. And the relationship is worth what you invest in it. If it's a good relationship, even if you're not making a lot of money, you're going to have a lot of advocates setting up. Like you have an amazing company who makes really cool games. You're the friendliest people on earth. You have great customer support and so on. So understanding the customers learning how to best communicate them, how to find, identify those different segments and serve their needs, and how to cater to like somebody who wants more content, somebody who wants more communication, somebody who wants more instructions, information. That's it. Thank you very much.